Hi all, Ben Jones here coming to you live from the data literacy headquarters here in downtown Bellevue, Washington. In this short video, I wanna share with you some of the insights we've gathered from our data literacy score team-based assessment. Now today is the two year anniversary of the launch of this offering. So it was back on January 24th, 2020, before COVID hit, right? That uh, this offering came out before masks and quarantines and <laughs> vaccine cards was even something we thought about. Uh, well, here we are in the new world. And of course, we've been looking for different ways to cope with uh, these times. And also in that process, we have been able to work with organizations around the world. Two years later, over 2000 individual responses have gone into this assessment. And that's uh, from people in dozens of teams all over the world, different industries, for-profit companies, government agencies, and nonprofits alike. So I wanna share with you some of the insights on the two year birthday of the data literacy score team-based assessment and the maturity model that goes along with it. Why am I doing this? Well, my hope is that these insights will be helpful to you in your quest to build more data savvy teams. So the data literacy score has a few different parts to it, but the first part is uh, includes 50 different statements. And these statements are uh, scored by respondents according to how well they feel they apply to their team at that moment in time. And so in that sense, this is a very subjective assessment. So it's only one data point that organizations are using to benchmark their progress and to come up with ideas for how to improve. Okay, so out of these 50 statements, which have scored the lowest? If we can identify those, Maybe we can share some common data pain points that we've heard from organizations. Maybe they apply to your organization as well. I know from my own personal experience, having worked in Fortune 500 environments, I can see why they're at the bottom of the heap and maybe you'll relate. Okay, so without further ado, let's go through them one by one. Number 46, ranking 46 out of 50, it comes from the technology category. And here's that statement that people score fairly lowly relative to the other questions or statements in the survey. So the statement is this, the ecosystem of data and tools and technologies is flexible enough to adjust to the changing needs of the organization. And so of course, you know, we feel that tools should empower and enable us to make use out of data, but instead so many people feel like they constrain them or they limit them as they look to use data to get their jobs done. So a question for us would be, you know, what are we doing to build flexibility? What are we doing to allow for a change and to accommodate that change within the tools and technologies that we offer to our team members? Okay, so number 47 out of 50 also comes from the technology category. And it goes like this, where there are different tools and technologies in use, they work well enough together that the overall system feels compatible and functional. So, you know, here we are, right, 2022. I mean, over the last decade or more, we know that the tools out there have evolved in an amazing way. But in many cases, you know, they've evolved on separate paths. They haven't always evolved together so as to be interoperable. And so there's a lot of friction there. And so the question for you is, you know, which interfaces are particularly cumbersome for your team members? And how can you build bridges between those systems and tools so that your team members feel like they have a chance to make it through this data landscape relatively unscathed? All right, number 48, three to go, right? Number 48 out of 50. Actually, this one comes from the people category. The statement is this, my organization provides valuable training opportunities to help me and my teammates develop the knowledge and skills necessary to effectively work with data in our roles. This one is all the way toward the bottom, right? Only two scoring lower. And so we feel pretty uh, convicted about this particular result uh, because training is what we do here at Data Literacy. And so I have three questions for you as it relates to training within your organization. Number one, do you offer great training opportunities and experiences for your team members? Okay, question one. Question number two, are they aware of the training that's available to them? And then number three, do they have the breathing room to actually take advantage of it? Now, of course, you need a yes in all three 
of those questions in order for training to actually help. And so it's something for you to think about and also to understand that, you know, it is common, at least in the experience that we've had with organizations seeking to benchmark their level of maturity with data, that people don't always feel that the training is where it needs to be for them. All right, two to go. Number 49 out of 50 comes from the process category. And it goes like this. When someone gets hired or changes roles within my organization, our processes adjust their access to data and tools in a timely and accurate fashion. Now, here's obviously a particular pain point for many, many uh, individuals. And we know that you know, organizations as a whole, well, they're putting a lot of focus on data and tools and recruiting top data talent, but how much focus are they putting on their processes? And do their processes actually allow them to make use of those other investments or not? Or are they pre preventing roadblocks and preventing talented people from you know, uh, putting data to good use? So that's the challenge of access to data, particularly. And it's a, a very acute pain point. You know, the larger the organization, the more difficult that can be. And, and of course, you know, we need to think about the steps involved in these processes and also identify who is responsible for carrying out those steps. Then we need to spend some time identifying bottlenecks or log jams and thinking of ways to eliminate them. And in that way, we're stealing a page from process improvement, from lean, and our team members are waiting, you know, not always very patiently in order to get access. And uh, for good reason. I mean, that's a frustrating experience for them. And I believe that's why we see this question, this statement rather, uh, scoring so low in the list. All right, number 50. This one really surprised me. It is the last on the list. The, the statement that employees of organizations we've worked with score all the way at the bottom. And it comes from the culture category. And the statement is this. My team has access to one or more thriving data communities with members that connect around data and its value as a resource. That question scored at the bottom, or it has thus far. And we all know the overused statement that culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? Well, one way to build a strong data culture is to create and support internal communities around data and to invite people to participate, to share, and to learn from each other. And the fact that this statement ranks all the way at the bottom of the pile, that says a great deal to me. Organizations can do so much more here, right? And the good news is, there are some relatively simple steps and ways to get started with data communities. I think it, you know, it needs to involve assigning someone the task of organizing different events, maybe tool-based user groups or a data book club, or maybe some kind of a lunchtime meetup group with speakers to share success stories or best practices. And the key here is to make it optional and to have fun with it. If you build little data communities, uh, people will get the message that data matters and they'll get involved over time. All right, one final insight I wanna share with you. We don't just look at the average scores, we also look at the variation in the scores and that is through the standard deviation. We want to understand the uniformity or lack thereof of the scoring of each of these statements. And so I found it interesting that the following statement had the highest level of variation in the scores, meaning people scored it very differently from each other, more so than any other question. And it comes in the ethics category. And here it is, my team includes diverse voices that help us to identify and eliminate sources of bias in our data so that people are treated fairly. Now this speaks volumes to me. Of the 50 questions, this one statement has exhibited the most variation over uh, the last two years with over 2000 respondents responding to it. Some rank that statement very high, others rank it very low. So let's stop and think about that. Why do you think that might be? Why do you think that might be? And what can we do to create environments within our teams and even within society at a much broader level such that that statement is scored highly by all? That's something I think for all of us to think about. And I hope we can move toward that, you know, as, an, as a, not only as teams and organizations, but uh, as a society and as a world. Okay, so that's all for me from now. Thanks for listening along.
I hope you found this short presentation interesting and helpful. If you have any questions or if you think the data literacy team can help you benchmark your own team's maturity, don't hesitate to let us know and reach out to us. Okay, everyone, take care. Bye for now.